And it says we're live, which is super. Awesome. Welcome to this um, Multi Music Technology Computer Music Week uh, interview. Interview. My guest this evening is Pete Brown from Microsoft, which is extraordinary. Do say hello, Pete. <laughs> Robin, thanks for thanks for having me on the show, and uh, hello to everybody who's joining us here live today. Awesome. You're very, very welcome. Please let us know that you can hear us in the chat before we get stuck in. So we'll just sort of going to drum our fingers until somebody says hello. And um, then we can get started. But I think everything seems to be running at my end, which is good. And uh, that's always a good example of, of how. Yeah, Windows I think you're is, really is it playing on your side, Robin, because I'm here in the, the actual show playing. Yeah, I can hear that. It's coming out somewhere. It's not coming out of me. You must have another device on somewhere. Well, let's see here. Hold on one second. Oh, you might need to mute. Oh, you stream. know, it auto started probably. I've got, uh, let me just close those other ones here if I've got it. Oh, there it is. There we go. There we go. See, if you knew your way around Windows, you wouldn't have this trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. It's when I have oh. 300 browser uh, tabs open. It's like, <laughs> yes, which, where's the music coming from? Yes. Uh, so yes, uh, thank you in the chat. You're saying that you can hear us. That's great. So we'll get we'll awesome. crack straight on then. Uh, we have a thousand things to talk about, and also one thing to talk about, I suppose, because Microsoft is is something which is part of all our lives and has been part of my life for many years. I was thinking earlier, as I was thinking about this stream, when it was that I first I first used it. So I remember my my mum had a had an Amstrad word processor. Uh, oh no! It went from that to a dual disk drive, dual floppy drive um, system, which I think was running DOS, and then into something mm -hmm. like uh, WordStar or something of that nature. And I'm trying to remember right. whether we got to Windows three on that machine. I think we probably did. Anyway, yeah, that was a I, long, long time ago. That was for, that was forever and a day ago. We yeah, can talk yeah. about old man things here if you want. Like uh, I always, ran Windows three on a two eighty six. That was fun, you know. So yeah, yeah. Well, I remember, yeah. I mean, one of the, the things that I used to, one of my anecdotes is that sound recorder didn't change for about 20 years. You know, you could still <laughs> run the only piece of audio software within Windows was sound recorder. And it was the same as it was in 3.1, as it was in sort of 95 and beyond. Yeah. I'm not quite sure yeah. when it finally got retired. Yeah, uh, it's it became voice recorder. And then actually the uh, kind of a sister team of mine has it now as one of their things. They're like, oh, what kind of stuff do you want to add in voice recorder? I'm like, oh, there's uh, all these things that we can do with like, to imagine a live band situation. But we'll see if that goes in. Yeah, yeah. So how did you become tied up in, in the big Microsoft firm then? Where's, what's a bit of your potted history? Sure. Um, so like I said, I, I ran Windows way back on a 286 ages and ages ago. And that was actually the last uh, desktop PC that I bought rather than built. Uh, so every PC since then I've built my own just for, uh, cause it's fun. I like it. Mm. Um, I, I really started with, so let's see how far back I should go. When I, when I was a young boy in, in middle school, um, I got into electronic music because they had Commodore 64s that were like brand new that were in the room. And the first time I heard music come out of one of those, for me, that was like, oh, wow, that that's absolutely amazing. I have to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I got into it that way as opposed to listening to like commercial music or something at first. Um, and then, you know, years later, I was uh, going to the music store that we had in town and I wanted to trade in this little Yamaha Porta sound that I got for Christmas and try to get a kind of a big boy keyboard, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I bought a used uh, HS60, which was a Juno 106 with speakers as the the keyboard i got there it was it was it's funny people say it's like the ugly juno but i always liked the look of it it was kind of neat um but it was designed after like the home organ market you know it had like mm -hmm. a little music stand on the back and all that kind of stuff um and when i was doing that they were like wow you know a lot about this stuff uh, you want a job so i got a job there when i was in high school um working there selling keyboards and doing stuff like that and that really got me into working with uh, you know Roland and Korg and a bunch of other companies for you know mostly just their sales folks, but learning enough to demonstrate keyboards and guitars and a bunch of other things there. Um, and then I didn't do anything with music for a while while I was in college, which is you know kind of unfortunate. Um, and then years later, I was looking for a career change from the consulting company that I was working at, 
And I knew a friend at Microsoft and he's, he's like, yeah, you got to come work here and here are all the reasons why you want to work here. And so I took on, uh, it actually took me two years to get hired. They did like one hiring thing and they were, it's, it's a bit of a complicated process. Mm. Uh, but I joined and uh, to help do uh, like training videos and evangelism and stuff for desktop developers, like people building in WPF and Silverlight and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so and, what sort of er yeah. what sort of era what sort of windows era are we in so this was 2009 right so that is uh windows uh seven uh right yeah uh windows seven era there um and then i was there through windows eight and sanofsky and all the, the kind of the dark times that we had there right uh <laughs> and during that time I started working really closely with the, the MIDI team and the audio teams, and I showed them some examples. Like I wrote just a quick sample of doing MIDI over a network, and I was like, look, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't using the actual MIDI API, but I'm like, look, it, this is the kind of thing that we can do if we have people who are interested in it. And they're like, wow, we never thought of doing that type of um, project here. And it got me really close with that MIDI team and the audio team. And I just kind of continued a relationship with them for a while. And then what was happening is um, every, every team at Microsoft churns, like there's a reorg every year and everybody moves around for different organizations and stuff. And so the people that you're dealing with on the team are almost never the same person mm. from year to year. And that gets frustrating for audio partners. So I put myself in there and said, hey, you know, audio partners, just if you put me as your point of contact, it doesn't matter who changes on these teams. I'll make sure that we get the right people behind it for engineering and stuff. Uh, and so that's what got me with all the audio partners. I started going to NAM and introducing myself. They're like, oh, we didn't know anybody with Microsoft cared about this and, and mm. whatnot. And it kind of snowballed from there. And it was never originally my job. It was just um, I had some success with it, so folks said, "Okay, yeah, keep going. That's that's great." All right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, a really it's been an awesome thing to actually have this this contact at Microsoft, whatever that means, because it to us outsiders it feels like such a an impenetrable fortress of a company. Yeah, um, and I mean, I've certainly had a lot of good inroads with my work on the surface for instance that got quite exciting for a little while there and i knew some people and i was getting to events you know getting flown right. over at microsoft's right. expense that was all super but then as you say they had a little bit of a shake up and boom i didn't know anybody and nobody knew me right. and i felt like i was having to sort of start all over again and, i know uh, it's it feels like that a lot yes yes and especially when yeah. i guess there's so many people doing so much work on your product if i can call it that um mm. that it's it's strange that you never seem to be able to get to talk to the people who actually uh, are behind it if that makes sense there is yeah there is a bit of that where um first of all not engineers should be in front of customers i'll, I'll just i'll just throw that out there <laughs> right yeah yeah totally um um, and that's the stereotype I, they, they're most of the people that i work with are perfectly fine but they have like if you think of it, their typical day, like what they're trying to do, if they're fixing bugs or working on features and stuff like that, like they need to be able to execute on the, uh, you know, the kind of the task that they've been given as opposed to um, getting kind of randomized by customer calls yeah. and, and partners and stuff like that. That said, there's an increased desire to make sure that different people on the teams are talking directly to customers to hear that. So there are times when, rather than kind of act as a buffer between the two, I will, if I can tell that this is going to be a, a, I would say a high value, both ways kind of engagement with a customer, I'll put them directly in contact. But I get a lot of kind of random, like, how do I fix X, Y, and Z? And I, I'm happy to deal with that myself. And I don't want to put that in front of the engineering team because then they'll never get anything done. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, you know, it's, it's for similar reasons that, um, I'm now the the voting rep at uh, MIDI org for Microsoft, so I don't uh, so they don't have to deal with that stuff. And I'm I'm probably going to increase my participation in that org here soon. Um, but uh, like that team doesn't have to worry about that anymore, right? They just they pay the bill, and then I deal with all the specs and voting and stuff, and then let them know kind of what the changes are. Um, and then I also work on some of the engineering stuff, mostly on MIDI uh, myself. As the audio stuff is far deeper than I would get into code wise. Uh, but it uh, again, it's, it's, it's 
some teams are going to be happy to have you talk directly to the engineers, but then other teams, it just doesn't make sense because they just, they have way too much to do. And if you think about mm -hmm. aud the audio teams doing not just everything for, you know, pro audio and musicians, but they need to do all the spatial audio. And um, like right now, their biggest things that they work on are all the things around um, the stuff that we do with teams and, and echo cancellation and audio effects and, um, you know, kind of gates and compression and all, all the things that you need to do to have a quality um, meeting. It, it sounds kind of boring, but there's actually a lot of audio engineering that goes on behind that mm. to then also optimize that for, uh, for bandwidth, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the one thing there's as a, as a person who, who has built computers or builds computers and tries to provide them as a product, the one thing that you, I think, you have to grasp early on is that Windows isn't designed for you. It's not designed for the person who wants to run a studio. It's designed for, well, office applications, but then broader multimedia applications and, and everything else, really, because it's such a huge market, takes precedence over your tiny little pro audio market. And it's yeah. really remarkable that any of it works at all. <laughs> you, know, you could say... It there, there are things there that are, uh, you know, for pro audio, like there are some tweaks that you wouldn't have if we didn't have audiences that needed some of these features, but everything else, like, you know, you and I were talking about um, performance plans and stuff earlier, mm. like this is all for optimize. If you think about like media consumption, which especially now is absolutely huge. Like our, during the, the whole COVID thing, our yes. consumption of media has gone way up compared to what it was before. Um, what you need for that, like if you want really good battery life is you want to have super high latency because you want to keep the yes. processor, like it, you want it to check once like every half second or, you know, a few times a second, as opposed to like every 10 milliseconds. Right. Uh, so that like the fewer times that it checks, like the longer your battery is going to, uh, last, the less work your processor is doing and everything. So those things are always right at odds with, uh, what we need for pro audio. So when you say you want super low latency on a device, well, that go you have to make sure that's optional and it's probably not the default because it's going to really kind of hammer the battery and it's not going to mm. be useful for most people. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's that's completely true. I mean, that's that's I mean, the other thing when we're talking about mm. what Windows has to cope with ultimately because the the, the big difference between Mac OS and Windows, at least from my from my perspective, is simply that, that all Apple have to deal with is their own hardware, relatively speaking. Yeah. Whereas Windows has to deal with all this stuff, a world packed full of different bits of hardware, and it's all just got to work. You've got to turn it on, press right. the button, and it's supposed to work. And so the, the amount of leeway you have to build into that kind of system to work with the range of driver architectures and bits of of stuff is is mind-boggling yeah this is this goes to what we were talking about before where um some years ago i started putting together a script for optimizing uh, you know kind of windows for audio like certain things that you might want to turn off and certain little little tweaks that are in there and i saw this question come up in the chat earlier as well and then as i got into it i very quickly realized that um the tweaks that people do are not universally helpful across mm -hmm. all devices, right? Uh, like you very, you really need to say, here is a set of tweaks for this version of Windows on this specific device for this piece of odd uh, kind of DAW software, right? Um, be, once you get beyond that and try to do something more generic, you very quickly end up with something that can hurt performance or mm -hmm. kind of break the PC. Or like I hear, I see like some people that are doing, um, uh, you know, disabling a lot of the uh, um, processor power management, which you and I have talked about, but they're doing it on a, like a normal, like really super thin laptop that already has really kind of honestly poor heat management. Like mm -hmm. there is no laptop with adequate like heat management. They, they basically, they have to throttle down because otherwise they burn up. Um, but once they, they do this and they have the laptop cranked all the time and they don't have like a cooling pad or something like that underneath it, you feel it heat up and that's really your laptop's lifetime, like going down every single time. <laughs> like the heat's bad for the battery, the heat's bad for the processor, all that stuff. Yeah. And so like just having this like tweak guides, I, I have this sort of hair across about like a lot of the tweak guides that are out there that um, 
like folks just blindly follow them because mm -hmm. it's a tweak. It says, here's the tweak guide for Windows 10. They do all these things and then their PC doesn't behave well later on. And they don't know why, uh, because like somebody said they're an authority on tweak guides and put this stuff out. And really there's a lot of super questionable things in there. Mm -hmm. Um, See, or even worse is like stuff that's from XP that they're saying yes. also applies to Windows 10, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, people probably don't know this, but I, I mean, I, I have a belief in that I believe I wrote the first tweet guide and every tweet guide since has come from my tweet guide because I, I released one in nice. a book in, uh, yep. in, you know, in print uh, in 1999, I think it was. Uh, which is yep. in my my first PC Music, the Easy Guide book. And I had the first list of uh, Windows 98 tweaks in there. Yep. And it kind of and I'm sure started it was from there. For 98. It was, yeah. yeah. It was brilliant. I mean, this this was in uh, in the time... This is when you were trying to get audio and MIDI to sync within Cubase. These were the sort of tweaks right. you needed to persuade right. your audio software to, to put those two things together. You know, I mean, yep. latency was not an issue because we didn't really consider it there was no real-time instruments you know you and and desktops were that. still the largest uh market then like yes. laptops hadn't taken over so a lot of the things about cooling and stuff that you worry about now weren't really an issue when you did your tweet guide you know mm -hmm. no that's right i mean in fact uh, because this is when just before we started carillon uh, carillon audio systems where we built a mm -hmm. purpose-built audio pc and up to that point no one had really thought about um, cooling and noise that had not been a factor you know computers sat there they were loud they sounded like a hoover vacuum cleaner sorry and right um and that was just how they were no one questioned it uh, and then when we started developing the the carillon we started digging up ways of making things quieter and then you started yeah. dealing with heat and heat flow and airflow because yep. you didn't think about those things either because it was just a plastic box you didn't think about putting right. grills in or dictating right. the way things move through a system you know um but of course this these things have, have since snowballed although i mean I, I don't actually think we've come as far as perhaps we we think we might i mean we are desktop pcs are still the same size and shape still taking all the same sort of bits and pieces they're just yeah. faster and, and more efficient i guess yeah i have uh on mine so i didn't have to compromise on the cooling at all it's on the other side of the wall here so I don't have to hear it at all. Like there's a oh, hole through the wall that all the cables go through. And I've got, uh, because I do more than just audio on that. I also do a lot of video rendering and it's my game. Yeah. It's my everything PC. So it's got a couple of water coolers in there, some big fans, things like that, mm. that uh, all make noise, but I don't have to hear them at all. <laughs> no, I mean, one of the questions I get asked all the time regarding sort of laptops, well, it's the classic question, is this laptop going to work? Uh, you know, with a random product number right, after that right. question. And I go, I have no idea. I mean, I had this I had this opportunity to test out a big Asus uh, Zen something or other. The one that has a screen and a half, like a half a screen down. Yes, the, yes. The keyboard. And it's got a, a desktop power processor in there. It's chunky, thick um, machine. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And... Um, mm -hmm. So I stuck a load of audio software on there, you know, masses of track counts and stuff. But then when I came down to playing it live with a just a keyboard and a virtual instrument, it would crackle. It would just yeah. crackle. Yeah. And there was nothing I could do about that until I turned off uh, turbo mode on the processor. And it was just yep. that action that allowed it to happen. Now, this is a phenomenally expensive, phenomenally powerful computer that's more powerful than my desktop, but it couldn't do the simplest task because there was something in there which was gonna which was just going to trip it out and that's the yeah. the unknown factor with any laptop or or desktop i guess i always think of desktops as a self-build so that's always a different thing yeah. but with a laptop you Mostly have laptops, no control yeah because yeah, you have no control over over what's inside the box and that's yeah. often where the problems lie right and there and again there are always like a lot of people who buy laptops for audio production and then just have the laptop sitting in their studio, they never bring it with them and they never perform live, should probably really get a desktop. And then a lot of mm. these issues that we think about with thermal management, you don't have to worry yes. about because it's they're, they can be adequately cooled with larger, quieter fans so it doesn't sound like a turbojet uh, you know, sitting in your, your studio mm -hmm. with you. Um, and, and you have some level of control over what's in there, you know? Like most people don't need to have a high powered graphics card for doing their their DAW stuff. Like just a normal thing will 
will work fine, right? And so if they yeah. don't have that, that's that's less to worry about that's in the system uh, that is, uh, you know, potentially conflicting with with your audio stuff. As we know, the video cards tend to be one of the biggest culprits for um, giving you uh, audio glitches and stuff in desktop mm. PCs. I mean, they certainly they certainly have been um, historically. I think in more recent times, certainly when Intel put the uh, put graphics inside the CPU, that seems to have closed that bottleneck rather. So you're yeah. not quite getting that that fear of onboard graphics that we had for quite yeah. a while. It doesn't yeah. seem to be there. Yeah, quite they were crap for a while. Yeah. yeah, they they were they were pretty bad for a while. Um, they're, they're adequate now. Uh, I wouldn't game with it, but they are uh, they're perfectly fine for you know pushing pixels onto the screen, even yeah. 4K screens. Yeah, well, I happily play uh, the original X-wing versus Tie Fighter on my Surface with no with no bother. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at some of the the comments in here. One person asked about uh, MIDI 2.0. What's going on there? We can talk about that during the call here. Yeah, no. More importantly, somebody pointed out my PC Music the Easy Guide book, which is still available yeah. in all good charity shops, I, I think. And there there were three editions, don't you know? And there's even a guitarist book I released. Oh, I was, I was crazy back nice. in the day. Nice. <laughs> back when uh, uh, writing books could be considered profitable. Yeah, yeah. No, although it never was. I mean, it's, no. I worked in a music shop while I was doing this, and I even had trouble getting the music shop to stock my own book. You know, <laughs> so it was hard. I, uh, it was an uphill struggle. I wrote. Uh, I've written three books. And those are uh, years ago. They were just, you know, for software development. But uh, every time I even think about writing another book, my wife is like, no, don't do that. You don't want to do that. Because she knows, like, that was before I had kids so that I wrote those. And now, yeah. you know, I, I remember staying up for 30, 40 hours just nonstop writing to try to meet a deadline as opposed to, mm. like, what I could do these days. Well, it would be a web series now. That's the thing, wouldn't it? That's what yeah. It to be. And they never... Like selling 10,000 copies was like, ooh, that's amazing, but you're not getting rich off 10,000 copies of a book. so Or 100 copies, depending upon which one you want to look at. Yes. So yeah, MIDI 2.0 uh, then. Yeah, he's mentioned that. So yeah, so there were two questions on there. One was BLE MIDI. And let me start with this one because I think it's important. There, So there are, there are third-party solutions for doing BLE MIDI and Windows using the current... APIs. We're talking about uh, so, Bluetooth, yeah. Sorry, let me just. I'm just yeah, sorry, chat. Bluetooth uh, low energy. Yes. The chat where I can sit, see it. It was uh, way up. Somebody said uh, BLE MIDI and Windows 10 is no, but I'm not sure what the if there was any uh, any context on that. So we do have support for uh, Bluetooth MIDI using the existing APIs, which all the DAWs use uh, from third parties, right? So let me let me put that out there. You can use it today if you want to. Uh, there's uh, the stuff that's been done for virtual MIDI as well as uh, uh, some things that have been done specifically to map uh, Bluetooth MIDI to that. So you can do some things there. It's kind of clunky um, only because it's not built in. It's not a single click and you're done. But the third party stuff actually works really well. The so what, so what, would, be, what would be required to do that? So it's, for instance, I have over there a, a Roly C board, yeah. uh, which can operate by Bluetooth and doesn't when I first tried it out. Um, so what would be the process of getting that to work, roughly? So there's um, there's virtual MIDI by, I think Tobias Erickson did the, the virtual MIDI stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. Right, so you use virtual MIDI for that. And then um, there is a Bluetooth MIDI uh, interface, uh, and it's killing me. I can't remember the name of the application, but there is, I, I'll tweet about it or something afterwards uh, once I look it up after the call here. Um, but there is a, a Bluetooth MIDI application that sets up a virtual MIDI port, like working with Tobias's stuff, that yeah. is connected to Bluetooth, right? And then we had a bug uh, in uh, Windows 10 2004 where some Bluetooth MIDI devices couldn't connect or pair to Windows. Uh, there was a Yamaha one and I think uh, one, or, one or two of the other ones. And then we realized what that problem was. And the fix is actually available as a KB uh, as of the 17th of this month, but it hasn't been pushed out on Windows Update yet. I'm not sure why it hasn't been pushed out yet, but it is it is fixed and available. So by the time folks look at this, it'll, uh, it'll be out there. Um, the second thing is we do have native Bluetooth MIDI support as part of our WinRT MIDI API. Now the WinRT MIDI API is what we created for Windows 10 
where we wanted Windows 10, uh, you know, store or UWP applications to be able to talk to MIDI using a new API that supports all the types of things we we wanted to support and and is ultimately extensible to us over time. Um, but the problem is like Cakewalk, uh, you know, and um, uh, Juice, I was trying to remember the other one. Uh, Juice are really the only things that support it. Like most of the uh, DAW companies didn't end up supporting it. Oh, and also Chrome and, and Edge support it as an option as well. Um, nobody else really wanted to support it because we have some naming issues and some other stuff. And so I've been working on the kind of significant updates for that uh, API over the past year or so, and it'll it'll be open source and available to folks to uh, as much as possible to modify. And I'll start pulling in some of the uh, some of the dog companies as well to update that API to get rid of all of the issues that the companies different companies have had that have kept them from adopting adopting that, as well as add in a lot of the features that people have asked for for. Um, you know, port naming and virtual ports and Bluetooth MIDI and a bunch of other stuff and ultimately make it possible to use um, MIDI 2.0, right? So that's, I had presented at NAMA, you know, last time uh, we had a, a NAMA in person that this was what we we're looking at for the future. And there were a couple of steps. There was, here's the API set today. Here's kind of the the MIDI 1.0 API refresh. And then here's the same thing with, uh, MIDI, what's called MIDI CI, which is capability inquiry, which is mm. the kind of stepping stone into MIDI 2.0, and then ultimately with MIDI 2.0. And then MIDI 2.0 requires a driver uh, to be created for that. It's a new USB MIDI driver, faster, et cetera, that, and it, but it's a new standard that we have to adopt. Uh, and that's really kind of the the lag on MIDI 2.0 is getting that driver written because we had once COVID hit and everybody started working remotely and then we reprioritized a lot of the stuff that's going on internally that got pushed off. And so I just, mm -hmm. I need those teams to create the MIDI 2.0 driver stuff. Um, but the MIDI 1.0 work will be available here uh, as soon as I can get that in front of uh, some of the audio partners uh, to test out. I, I want to get that in front of them before we put it out in front of the public. But I'm pretty excited about that because it's it's something that I've wanted to see in Windows for a long time. And I think doing it in the open uh, kind of once we have the the beginning of it here available is the right way to do that. Mm. Do you feel that does Microsoft react to those kinds of inquiries? So something coming from MIDI.org, um, they want to do this. Is that it does is Microsoft nimble enough to react to that kind of thing or does it have its its path that it's always plowing? It depends on what we're looking. At. Oh, sorry, uh, MIDIberry. Somebody responded. That's the uh, the BLE MIDI uh, application that you can use. Thank you, uh, conditional instability for that. And yes, Jim, uh, Bluetooth MIDI is exposed to UWP apps. That's the WinRT MIDI API. Um, so whatever. Ro oh, so one other question before we get this. So whatever mm -hmm. Roly is missing to support Bluetooth on Windows will be coming soon. Uh, depends so what what i didn't finish on that last one is the new midi api requires adoption just like uh, the winrt one did um, we can't really extend in the way that we want the um the, the kind of the classic midi api that we have the win mm or when uh win 32 midi um it's all it requires a bunch of kernel work and everything to extend that the, and it's not it was never designed to be extensible or to be something that you could easily uh, have become, uh, uh, you know, MIDI 2.0, which deals with packets of data as opposed to streams of data and stuff. So it's just, it's just not the right API to be able to move forward. Uh, so there will be some work on my part to, tr to work with the dog companies to get them to switch over to the new API. And the reason it failed before is because we had things in it that they didn't like, um, like the, the bad port naming, quite frankly. Uh, and, is that uh, like sort know, of cakewalk yeah. naming of things? Because you know, in in Sonar, everything any any port within Sonar is ridiculously named and unhelpfully named, and doesn't ever seem to make any sense. Uh, is that is that kind of the is that it's, where it's probably it's coming from. those names from? So yeah, it, the the way that the drivers expose the names, it's weird. This this is what we tried to fix in WinRT MIDI, and and frankly failed. Um, <laughs> There are there are a couple of places where the the name of the port can come from in the driver, 
and not everybody does it the same way. And so we were mm -hmm. trying to make a best guess of kind of like how to get the the port name from these devices. And frankly, I think, you know, we made it worse with WinRT MIDI, um, but we just, we couldn't change that after we put it out there. Um, and so I really think like having that name available and having the original name available from uh, the, uh, um, the WinMM API, the way it pulled it as kind of separate properties on the object and then allowing the user to provide their own persistent name for the port, and having all three of them, um, which is a lot of names, but I think having all three of them will get companies what they need and get users mm -hmm. what they need as well. So they can, um, like, they, like Novation wants to be able to see that this particular device with this name is theirs. Like they're looking at the name and trying to say, hey, oh, that's my device, right? Um, they need to be able to have that. And so the companies that rely on that didn't want users renaming the ports because they're searching for something. So you have all mm -hmm. three available. But that's something um, which has massively improved, though, isn't it? I mean, something that yeah. I've noticed is plugging in MIDI controllers. Uh, drivers are found. I very rarely have to install yeah. uh, any MIDI drivers at all. It's all found. It all appears in the device manager. It comes up with, uh, w w yeah. with what it is and what it's doing. The only thing that fails is Korg because they're using a, a driver from, I think, Windows 2. They right. don't seem to have well, the only reason... The only reason a lot of those companies have created their own drivers for it is to be multi-client, right? And that's mm -hmm. another one that I don't think I want to deal with at the driver level, but the new API will support. There are some weird things with multi-client that you can just say, oh, well, we'll just let them like deal like the drivers do and just let it happen and not care. But if you have two applications open and they start both sending sysx, it gets really messy at that time because you're crossing the two sysx streams and then the whole api can get confused and for the most part like if it's just a, a normal usb midi stream you're like well fine it's just going to get garbage on the other end and going to get confused but the bluetooth stuff requires the sysx to be properly packaged up so that you have the start and end in there and you're sending like a complete one each time and then that can become a bit uh, you know, a bit that can be quite a bit more of a mess to have to deal with. And I want to make sure we do that right, as opposed to just letting everything through and, and saying, hey, fine, because because you can't mm -hmm. say like a DAW, if you have a DAW and then you also have like an editor open side by side with that and the DAW sends some sysx and the editor sends some sysx, whose fault is it when it doesn't work anymore? It's like the only thing in common is is Windows there. So we need to handle that on our side. Hmm. That's interesting. It's a bit like uh, sample rate, isn't it? Trying to um, get that consistent across a system in order to get things work. I mean, does the naming hmm. um, issue come about through unplugging and replugging? Because, uh, I mean, often you think that, that Windows would very much like you to have everything plugged in continuously and in the same ports and in the same place, whereas right. you're, you're taking things over there, you're taking it out to a gig, you're bringing it back, plugging different things in. And certainly in my position, when I'm reviewing lots of different gear, there's a constant churning of of different drivers and architectures going on all the time. Is that a is that a factor, a detrimental factor to, to running it? it? It can be, because if you want to keep um, persistent names, and this is where hmm. uh, you know port identification can be a little hairy, uh, is the as part of the USB spec, there was supposed to be a, a like a serial number, and I'm going to use the wrong term here. Sorry, I, I think it was called like a serial number for each device that you plug in, so that when you unplug it from one port and plug it into another port, it doesn't show up as a new device, right? right. But right now, sometimes when you if you take a device and you unplug it from one port and then plug in another, if you see it says new USB device, you know, installing the driver or whatever, that means that device does not have the serial number that's in the spec. And so it's seen as a new device on there. Uh, and that's, that is a massive pain for kind of like any kind of persistent port renaming or anything like that. And if you're on a desktop, I have 80 some odd USB devices connected to this PC, believe it or not, that, I, that I've got here, not, not just music, but everything else that I deal with. Um, and so I leave them plugged in all the time because I don't want to deal with that. Uh, but if you're on a laptop, it's perfectly normal to unplug them and plug them in every single mm. time. And it's uh, again, and if you have, you know, like a couple of Novation launch pads, well, which one, which one is the one that uh, was used to be in port A versus port B? And that's always going to be a bit of a mess. And we'll have to do our best to try to, to 
sort that out. Um, but it's not that part's not going to be perfect, honestly. Mm. That's yeah. something that doors, but they, I think, if they had. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. I say if they had implemented the serial number in there, you would not have that problem. Mm. I was going to say that in the fashion indoors at the moment is to try to to micromanage uh, MIDI, which I I personally find really quite frustrating. Uh, Studio One does it, Bitwig does it, where you can't. I just want to have. I want to plug stuff in and make it work. I don't want to have to create a new instrument and allocate it ports. And then next time I start up and Studio One goes, oh, your stuff's changed. It's like, I know. Yeah. And do you want to reconnect it? I don't know. I don't know what it was last time I was running it. You know, you have those sorts of conversations with yourself. Um, I'm a Studio One user and that mm. I appreciate what they've done, but I also hate what they've done. <laughs> like, I, I, want, I want that in Windows mm. and for DAWs to be able to just query that information. Like, exactly. There's no reason every single DAW should have to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that does, does bring us, I guess, to one of the bugbears that comes up uh, often when we talk about these things. It's, it's an audio thing as well, in that we are, or we have been for many, many years, crying out for a centralized place, for Windows to kind of take over these bits that all of these software manufacturers are trying to hook themselves into. If only there was a, a centralized place, as you say, for, for MIDI, but also for audio. I mean, somebody mentioned yeah. in the chat about ASIO for all. Why doesn't Microsoft adopt that? I think I've had a conversation with you in the past about Copperland or something of of that yeah. nature. It's like there's there's stuff out there that's very elegant. And it wouldn't it be wonderful if that was just part of Windows so that we no longer had to worry about it? Yeah, I, I agree. Um I don't see that happening in the short term with audio itself, um, but the intent with MIDI is to have that one centralized place. And you know, MIDI 2.0 brings a lot of this to the table as well, mm. so it starts to make sense for the OS to to hold some of this information. But um, yeah, I'm working on configuration screens and persistent uh, um, persistent configurations that you can load and save as necessary based upon your. Um, your use at that time. And, and this is more like the laptop uh, user or something, just stored as JSON files on the PC. The ser like I said, the serial number thing is where it starts getting a little messy, but being able to you know store all that, save your virtual ports, uh, save all, all your port names, all of that stuff together and load it up as needed is a huge part of this. Mm. I think that makes a ton of sense there. I'd love to see the same thing for audio, but that's that's a different story. There's a... It, audio is so, so so much more complex than MIDI. Like MIDI has a very discreet audience that we deal with. Yeah. Setting aside the black MIDI folks who give me a hard time all the time about not being able to play like eight thousand notes at once, uh, you know, constantly through the system. The um, the the audio side though has like everybody uses audio. Right, like everybody uses it in some way, and then you have the spatial audio stuff and the mixed reality stuff and the gamers and everything else. So that one is a like quite a bit more work to be able to do something like that. So I'll do it for MIDI, <laughs> and then then we'll see what we can convince people to do for audio. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, actually. Back to my back to my book again. <laughs> yes, is that, so tell um, me about your book, Robin. No, no, no. It's, it's just I find it fascinating because I because when I wrote it, I wrote about MIDI and how transferring MIDI over the internet and how cool that was, you know, over dial up and that kind of thing and how um, MP3 would be a passing fad because it's far too big to send over the internet <laughs> and what a waste yeah. of time that would be. Uh, and it was, Terrible. I mean, I mean, MIDI was part of the gaming engine back then, you know, things like Doom were all run on, uh, were playing back MIDI files yep. and you could swap yep. MIDI files out of games if you, if you knew what you were doing a little bit and people were using trackers to, to generate sounds and soundtracks for games. Um, and and you're right, all that stuff has been has been well left behind. It's, it's an ancient technology as far as everyone else is concerned, except for us. And funnily enough, MIDI is now becoming a big thing again uh, after yeah. being, it's kind of slept inside the computer for a, for a decade or so because we all, we all went in the box. And now we're all outside the box again. And it's, everyone's going, how do I make this work? It's true. Like all the, the new hardware that we've had, um, which is, I love it. Uh, as you can tell around mm. here, I, I absolutely thrilled that we have all this hardware available to us now and it works cause it's new. Like I have, yeah. what you don't see is another room full of uh, synthesizers that I've bought, 
you know, uh, parts are not working basically where I'm repairing them so I can use them. And that's really the only affordable way to get some of them in any case. But there are far more broken ones out there, even sold as working fine, than there are like, you know, good working uh, um, classic synths. But so I'm happy to see all the new stuff that's available as well. But the the MIDI stuff as, as a kind of a, a resurrection of the old technology is funny because when I started at Microsoft, I started doing some of the MIDI stuff. I would speak to different teams uh, way back at the beginning of this. And they're like, MIDI, you know, is that the, the ringtones for old phones basically is what they thought MIDI was. It was not <laughs> something like this. And they're like, oh, isn't that a dead technology? Nobody uses that. I'm like, well, there are actually a lot of people using that and had to go through an education process because most people... Mm outside of our circles here have no idea what it is right it's it they think it's midi files that you play back sort of cheesy sounding general yes. midi music on your pc it's not it's not the kind of the glue that's connected all these studios together uh, but i've had so i created a powershell and for folks who aren't familiar with it, powershell is a scripting uh application and language on uh on windows based on net but i created a powershell midi um set of uh, of commands and stuff some years ago and one of the people that was using it told me they use it to synchronize all the different mixers they have around in this mega church um right. i'm not a religious person so i've never been to a, a mega church but apparently they have you know five or six different mixers inside this place and they need a way to synchronize them all and so he uses this powershell midi application i have to through MIDI, synchronize all these different mixers and different settings on them and stuff. So people are using it for everything mm -hmm. that you like. It's 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 there. Like wherever there's a performance, there's probably MIDI somewhere back there doing something that you may not be aware of, even if it's not connecting synthesizers together. Mm. It's super important. Yeah, it is. It's very true. And also, I mean, synchronization came up uh, last night in my my live stream when I was talking about you know an introduction to making music on a computer. And it was one of those things that we used to have to try really hard of. And again, we've lost those skills somehow because you don't need to worry about synchronization within the context of a computer. It's only when you go outside of that that you suddenly go, oh, right. how do I make these things stay in time? Is that easy? Because MIDI is, is clumsy. You know, it's stupid. It doesn't know what it's doing. It's just, you know, it's, it's kind of pouring out of the end of the cable until you plug it into something. And then it just stuffs data in that direction. Um, and you hope that, that works together it's, it's not thinking about anything it's just it's just yeah. churning stuff through and so trying to get all these things to hang together is it can be remarkably difficult and as i say we, we've got out of the practice of uh of doing that and uh, it's an interesting time i mean i think the the best advice i can give to people who are struggling with synchronization is to not worry about it you know either don't do it or just press play on two yeah. things at the same time you know go back yeah. to a, a more basic uh, sense of how things are you know how things are holding together listen to the timing it doesn't have to be computerized um yeah perhaps yeah not computerized it's... what are we talking about <laughs> i know uh so one person asked here and this is a really good question mm. i don't understand why asio drivers produce less latency for daws than microsoft windows audio shouldn't microsoft standards be more efficient and i think that's mm. a great question and so let me let me explain this one for a second so uh, ASIO is a very thin layer on top of a piece of hardware. So a typical ASIO driver is delivered by the hardware company, and there's almost nothing in between the API and the hardware. Like it's Windows doesn't really get involved in it. It's just it's it's almost directly talking to hardware at that point. And so it could be as efficient as they want it to be. Now, in practice, uh, most ASIO drivers are written by the same two companies out there and they're just sold to all the different hardware manufacturers. So like when you see major performance differences from one to the other, it may be that they have written their own ASIO driver or they've really optimized some code or something like that. The uh, Windows Audio, on the other hand, and, oh, and sorry, and so ASIO also, like what goes in is what comes out. It doesn't do bit rate conversion. It doesn't do any, you know, mapping or anything like that. It is one to one with a device. Uh, it's just there for performance. Um, whereas Windows Audio, it does things like, you know, if you have 
uh, music that's uh, recorded at 44.1 and your Windows audio is set to you know 48, it's going to do that kind of resampling and it's going to uh, get that uh, data to the device um, mixed in the format that it requires. It's going to um, do processing for uh, different effects that you have. Uh, like if you look in your, if you right click in your audio device and look at the properties there, there are different effects that can uh, be included as part of that Dolby audio and a bunch of other stuff. And so Windows audio does a bunch of that. And in fact, we looked at uh, uh, changing Wasapi or adding some features to Wasapi some time ago to make it um, easier to combine or aggregate multiple devices like Apple's core audio does. Mm -hmm. And when we looked at it, we knew that our latency would never be as good as ASIO's latency. And when it comes down to it, uh, ASIO's latency is what everybody uses as their benchmark. And it latency always wins any argument. Like whenever you're talking mm -hmm. to somebody, they say they would be interested in these other features, but when it comes down to it, folks are counting milliseconds for audio latency because that's, you know, that's it's like counting, uh, you know, percentages of gigahertz increases when you're overclocking your PC. It's the metric everybody goes by, yeah. and so we decided uh, way back that the audience would not be large enough uh, for us to use Wasapi even. Um, uh, and add these features to it because it's a lot of work to add these features because folks would still prefer to use ASIO. Now, that said, um, we did do some work in Wasapi for uh, controlling the buffer size so that if the the underlying driver allows us to do it, and we worked with Realtek and Qualcomm and a bunch of other ones at the time, uh, you know, Wasapi can set it into kind of lowest latency mode and have buffers that are as small as the hardware will support. So you can actually get pretty decent performance for onboard audio uh, on like a Surface or some of the other devices out there. But it's still, if there was a native ASIO driver, it would probably be even a little bit better. Um, although with an onboard audio chip, it's it's not going to be night and day difference. So, you know, ASIO really does best when it's kind of a dedicated piece of external yeah. hardware. Yeah. Right. And so there's ASIO for all, which I know you've used a bunch, Robin, um, mm. which is nice in that it gets past a bunch of our API stuff, which adds a bit of latency and gets as low as you can in Windows um, to talk to the audio device there. There's still plenty of windows between it and the piece of hardware. So, you know, it's not super low, um, but it is close enough. And that, and what that ASIO for all does is it kind of maps the ASIO API to these, uh, you know, Windows devices um, in as efficient way as they're able to, to make it possible for any application mm -hmm. that relies on ASIO to do that. Uh, it's not perfect though. It's, it's a layer on top of a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah I, no, I'm it, interested. It's not, yeah. So oh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not the most stable thing in the world, but it, it has, it does help out. That's the thing. I mean, it gets you from a situation where something is, is laggy to the point where it's playable. Yeah. Acceptable. Right. Yeah. I right. can deal with that. That's all right. And that's, that's kind of what you need in a um, in a laptop context in context or when you're trying to make music on the go or on the bus or you're just trying to do little bits and pieces where you don't perhaps have your piece of hardware, your usual audio interface uh, to yeah. hand. I always think it's remarkable that the ASIO itself hasn't really come on. I mean, I remember the Soundscape mix stream, I think it was. Um, this was back in the the turn of the turn of the millennia i think that sort of time and it supported uh 16 asio drivers it was multi-client and i don't think i've ever seen an asio card that was multi-client since and what it meant right. was that you could run i mean we built a carillon system around it and you could run uh reactor contact your door um retro as1 or whatever it was that we were running at the time all these uh, very early software synthesizers that ran on their own um, ASIO driver and you could run them all at once on the one system all going through the mixer for the Soundscape card. Nothing yeah. else I don't think has done that since and we're kind of stuck into this single device um, ASIO world which is its, its kind of biggest flaw I suppose in that you can run the one audio interface that's, that's your yeah. only choice and the one application. You know, It's true because I I wanted a lot of ports here, and so I'm still on a PCIe solution for audio on this PC where 
Um, I have 96 inputs and outputs on a Motu 424 right. uh, card, and yeah. uh, it performs really well. Yeah. Um, but I've maxed it out, uh, you know, at the 96 IO, uh, and I can't aggregate it with anything <laughs> else. Or at that point, and it's like uh, um, it's just you're kind of stuck with what that is. It's not really multi-client in that it handles the stuff in hardware. Um, the nice thing I do like is it does something that a lot of audio devices don't, which is I can use Windows Audio and ASIO at the same time if I want to, as long as I keep them at the same bit rate. So yes. um, I found uh, years ago that I had the most stable audio at 96.24, right? I don't, I don't believe 96 sounds any better or anything. It just, it, I was getting glitching before at 48 that I don't get at 96. Go figure. I have no idea. Something weird mm -hmm. in the driver, I guess. Um, and then, uh, uh, so I, I found that as long as I have all my Windows audio output set to the same as what I use in ASIO, it's glitch free playback. I could, if I wanted to watch a video and, uh, you know, do recording stuff in, um, you know, studio one or Bitwig or something like that at the same time and not have any problems, but a lot of devices mm. don't do that. Mm. Um, I'm surprised actually at how many don't do that. Yeah. I think windows 10 might've helped with that. Um, cause it was certainly a bigger problem than it is now. Although there were a lot of interfaces at one time that would have an ASIO driver. It also come with a giga studio or giga sampler driver and then a windows mme driver it's all like have a have a kit so you could run those three uh, at the same time potentially running like a uh, rebirth standing by itself yeah. alongside cubase or alongside something else and uh, and yeah. make those two work together uh synthetic asked i'm late did he talk about the future of microsoft and bluetooth mini uh answer is yes would be nice to use my rolly gear over bluetooth on windows not just on mac so just to be clear on that, we can do everything possible here to make it so that um, they could use Bluetooth. And we've already done a bunch, um, but they have to do the work on that, right? That's their application has to make the API calls. They could do that today uh, if, um, if, if they felt that was an appropriate uh, route for them to take with their application, but it's, it's just up to them. Hmm. Does it work both ways? Does can Windows send MIDI over Bluetooth to other external devices? It can. It can. And, and to be fair to Roly again here, uh, also, if their, their application, which uses uh, Bluetooth there, is something that they could change easily if they wanted to. But for controlling inside a DAW, then the DAW vendors have to use the API that we provide, or uh, folks need to use the um, uh, MIDI Berry stuff plus uh, the, the uh, virtual... Uh, it was a TE virtual MIDI that uh, Tobias has put together. Um, but I've got, you know, like, I've got a couple of these that I've been using uh, oh, yeah. recently to test out stuff. I have a ton of different uh, MIDI interfaces here just to test performance and test uh, capabilities and stuff over time. And it all works. Uh, it's just, like I said, it's a matter of... of giving the DAW companies what they need uh, to be able to move forward and use the APIs we'd like them to use. Are they responsive, um, software, hardware manufacturers? Do they do they like being told what to do? Uh, so nobody likes to be told what to do. Uh, <laughs> I try to be nice and ask them, um, and it, it depends. Some software manufacturers, uh, their, their process is such that they figure out what they're going to do a year in advance, and they execute on that, right? Uh, it's very much a you know, kind of a mm -hmm. waterfall approach to software development. Whereas other ones are more agile and more interested in in doing um, you know stuff early on. Like I did a whole lot with Cakewalk before, you know, with yeah. Noel and the folks over there because they were super interested in, in ways that they could differentiate. So they added touch support for Surface. They actually mm -hmm. added support for the Surface dial for a little bit there. That was that little uh, puck that you could use for a turn and stuff. A bunch of those things and bitwig studio has done a lot of the same things like if you go to dan yeah there you go there's the surface dial. uh if you go to the nam show when it was uh an in-person event uh they would always have a surface studio in there showing bitwig because it works so well on a yeah. big touch screen so some of those companies are super responsive and other ones it takes them a bit more time to um to implement features and they and they're all trying to do the right thing for their customers and you know we're not their customer we're saying hey here's what we think you should do and they have to look and say is that a value to their customers and if it is great 
with the new MIDI API that we'll have, I think that that'll definitely be a yes. It's just a, a matter of making sure they have everything that they need to to move that forward. Mm. Nice surface nice. style, by the way. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a beautiful piece of uh, equipment that doesn't do a whole lot, but it's still a no, beautiful it's, piece it's of search equipment. Of a, it's one of those things that's kind of in search of a... Um, like there's the CAD scenario where you could put it on the screen and dial stuff, yeah. which is kind of cool. Have I seen anybody using it in the wild that way? No, no. right? Um, but it's it's such a cool idea. It's just a kind of in search of a, a great mm. use case. But I it mean, is pa good for video editing and scrolling through stuff. Yeah, I mean, Pablo Martin from Smiths and Martin originally, um, he did wrote this piece of software called Elephant. So I'm just scratching some spider yes. tool off it. Yes. And uh, which I did a video on a fair while ago now, but that he somehow magically captured it. I mean, it was it was quite fascinating because I was sort of having a conversation with him while he was developing this idea, and we were sort of talking about it, and then he'd give it another go, and then he'd, he'd come back to me and say, "No, it doesn't work. I can't make it work." And then we'd chat about it a bit more, and he'd come back the next day going, "Oh no, I did this right. Now it does this," and like, we've now got half a knob moving somewhere, and we've now got something else mapped somewhere else. And then the following week, he'd come back, and he would have made another massive breakthrough from. The week before saying oh it's just not possible just completely impossible so it was quite a fascinating little journey but now it's it it works brilliantly well you can you can touch if you've got a touch screen you can touch a, a knob a, a control on a piece of software and then it will change it i mean it's, nice. it's easier probably just to mouse it or just to finger it in the first place but that process and that action is there so you could make very fine adjustments if that's if that's what you wanted to do you know and that software is part of inspiration for what i wanted to do with the midi api to make it easy to plug um kind of write i don't want to call them plugins but i'm going to call them plugins anyway mm. um your own little uh bits of code that can run in there and surface midi devices to other um, applications doing that in a secure way that's not going to allow people to write really malicious stuff and install it on your pc that does all kinds of nasty things is always a concern but i i really want to make sure that that's possible and through virtual midi stuff and uh and kind of more of a framework around kind of these midi plugins i think will be the right way to go with that but somebody could very easily write a little application not a driver but like just a little app that reads from the surface dial and mm. surfaces that as MIDI data right same thing with anything else that you have uh, and that's uh i was also inspired a bit by if you've ever watched sonic state um Nick Bat's always doing stuff with um, his, he has like these little MIDI controllers that he would use for switching video cameras and a bunch of yes. other stuff. And he's got it all routed just through MIDI on his, uh, on his Mac. And I thought, wow, that's brilliant. Like he, and he's not a software developer, right? He can do some code, but he's not a software developer and him being able to very easily set that up and, and have something that just works on his computer is um, something that I want to have uh, on windows mm -hmm. as well. He's very slick as well. I mean, you could you can just about if you look in, you can notice his little switching every now and again yeah. when he switches cameras. But it's very slick. Is our Nick? He's very good at that. Very practiced. Actually, he had a question which I spoke to before we came on air. Actually, that be worth bringing up at this point. And that was oh, yeah. that he's he's just got hold of an M1 Apple, mm -hmm. um, and he's been doing a load of testing, bits and pieces, fantastic, blah blah blah. blah. But his question is, can it run Boot Camp? which for those who don't know is being able to run windows on it essentially right and for folks who haven't uh kept up with things lately the m1 meaning the the apple processor not the cork synthesizer from years and years ago yeah uh, but right. <laughs> the um so first of all like i think what apple has done with that is is pretty amazing like all the initial reports i've seen for performance and stuff look really promising and you know, kudos to them for for getting this out there. I can't wait to see some daw bench type uh, performance there mm. to see how that's doing for musicians. But like I looked at Cinebench and some other stuff, and it performs really well. So you know, that's pretty awesome for them. Um, will it run boot camp? Um, so Apple had come out a while ago and said no, um, but then I saw they said, well, it's it's kind of up to Microsoft. Um, but I'm. I'm going to sort of speak out of turn here in that I don't know what's happening internally in, in some other parts of the company. Um, and if this is being considered, I'm sure somebody's thinking about it in one way or another. But um, 
from what I understand about the the architecture of the M1 is it's not just an ARM processor. There's a lot more to it. Like they have um, a different way of parallelizing the instructions when they come in, a different, um, a lot of like different approaches there to make it so that frankly it performs better than most other ARM-based processors out there. Um, and I don't think, and again, I'm, I'm kind of talking out of my ear here, but I, I don't think you can just take Windows on ARM and run it on that. Like I, there must have to be quite a bit of other engineering effort that uh, has to happen to make that work. Um, if it's possible, and if it's something that Apple supports, then I'm sure somebody in the company is working on it, right? Like um, that, it seems like too large an opportunity for us to pretend doesn't exist. Um, but as far as I know right now, there's nothing happening there to make that happen. Um, so we'll see in the future. But as it is right now, like Windows on ARM doesn't run on that and um, x86 Windows also doesn't run on that. Uh, I think the only option on Apple's uh, new M1 is to run it inside a virtual machine, right? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that would do an x86 emulation, you know. Okay. Now, the licensing part that, that they would bring up is we don't sell Windows on ARM separately um, like you can just go buy, you know, Windows um, for x86 or, or 64 out there. And again, the reason is like the ARM devices are all different. Like you, there is no single ARM processor where we just say, hey, this is this is an ARM processor and it's 100 percent compatible with this other ARM based processor like that isn't really that mature at this point because it's grown up from a very integrated ecosystem of phones, which is really where ARM was doing the most work um, for their application processors, where, you know, the the processor and the operating system that it ran on were very tightly coupled, right? Um, having it pulled out to the level where you can go buy an ARM system on chip uh, at your local Newegg or something like that seems your local Newegg, <laughs> Newegg online or, or Amazon or anything like that. We're not there yet. Like, I don't know if it's going to get to that point um, and if it'll become something that people can build themselves and therefore be able to just like buy an off the shelf uh, Windows ARM license. Um, mm. I don't know, it's, it's honestly, it's kind of early. So, I, you know, we'll see how that goes in the future. Is that applicable to something like the Surface X? Is that uh, is that ARM based? Yeah. So the the Pro X is using, uh, well, depending on which one you get, we have the SQ1 and SQ2 processors, which That's are right. uh, made with Qualcomm, and they're uh, they're kind of a, a modification to I forget exactly what the processor name is, but it's their application processor. But again, it's that's different from what Apple has. And like we, we both, mm -hmm. for example, have um, machine learning accelerators on the chips, but the APIs to use them are probably, or the, the way that you use them is most likely different. Um, and now we're st we start getting into like, I don't know the chips well enough to be able to make mm -hmm. any definitive thing there, but I, I know that they are not like, um, um, they're not as identical as you might get with x86. Yeah. So back in the in the good old days when Apple were running all Intel inside, that made things made things a lot easier. I mean, the, similarly, yeah. when we when I was selling computers, I would sell uh, Hackintoshes or systems that could be turned into into Apple Macs, and it right. wasn't it wasn't easy thing to do. You know, it took a little bit of, of thought and time and an effort, and you couldn't guarantee you'd get a result at the other end. But it was achievable. It was something you could certainly do. Right. And that's, and actually, it's it's amazing that folks are able to get that to work because Apple could very easily have made it only work with the processors that they specifically include in their Apple devices, right? There's there's no reason they couldn't have just like stopped that and uh, made that impossible. Um, now, though, I think it'll kind of be the default, right? So one, you can't buy an M1 off the shelf somewhere, um, and two, the M1 has um, co-processors and, and other parts of that system that are um, not just security related, but just stuff that the operating system is probably going to rely on that's not going to exist in a third-party ARM processor unless somebody comes out and does their best effort at a clone of that and makes mm -hmm. it something that you can plug in on a, on a motherboard. So I, this may all happen. Don't get me wrong. I like predicting that something will be impossible is usually a failing, <laughs> uh, a, a failing approach. So it's entirely possible that 
10 years from now, we see that we are with ARM processors where today we are with x86, where there's just, they're, they're commodities, they're available everywhere that's been fully standardized and folks, and folks can uh, kind of plug in and play as necessary. Um, mm. But we're not there today. No. Today. I mean, there's always this, these two dynamics, isn't there? there? There's Apple and the walled garden approach who that makes sense. It makes sense to to if you want things to work well, you need to, to yeah. narrow the amount of technology that you're using and make it run on one yeah. thing. And at the other side of the, the, the fence, I suppose, is open source where, uh, well, I mean, ARM comes from that that sort of direction um of of trying to make things as open as possible to allow for as much development and evolution of things as possible it's interesting how these yeah. both things are you know butt up against each other and yet they exist in the same space yeah i wouldn't say arm comes from the open source side i mean there's like risk five which is trying to do an open source version risk processor to compete with arm but it's kind of academic at this point um Although I would like to see that succeed because I love the idea of a completely open source, no license required processor that uh, people can build on. Uh, but again, it's it doesn't have the muscle behind it that that ARM has, especially now that ARM is going to be, I don't know if, when it goes through, but owned by NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. uh, then that like there's a lot of muscle in NVIDIA and they've done a lot like our original surface. The first Surface that we released, the Surface RT, way back in, was it 2012 or whatever, was running an NVIDIA ARM-based processor inside. It was dog slow, uh, honestly, at the time. And it was our first attempt at running something on ARM. Uh, but uh, it was NVIDIA-based. So they have a lot of experience in the ARM area as well. And so I'll be curious to see what they do with that. But I don't mm -hmm. expect them to go the route of open source or, or kind of make making it open to everybody um, without a license at that point. It would be nice to see it happen, though. Yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff. So any burning questions that people have in, in the chat, do do throw them in as we are going from software to hardware to back and drivers again, um, you know, rounds in different circles. So, uh, you know, any, any questions are very, very welcome for any part of anything that we're even closely talking about. Somebody said they're going to install Mac OS on my Acorn Archimedes A3000. Yeah, the ARM stuff's not quite that backwards compatible. <laughs> I it's used funny, to you know, people still spell ARM with three capital letters because it used to stand for Acorn Risk Machine, right? But back in, <laughs> I think it was like three years ago, they changed it so it's no longer an acronym. It's just capital A, lowercase r, lowercase m. I used to we sell... still need to update all they used to sell Sibelius on uh, Acorn Risk computers back in in Turnkey again at the end of the nineties. It was the fastest computer on the uh, in the in the building. I think uh, it, all it ran was Sibelius. That's all they had, and we'd sell entire systems about three thousand pounds worth of stuff for someone to write score. Uh, amazing. Yeah. Jim Young says, "I have a Surface RT. I've still got one here too, Jim, and I've also got." Um, if you had it, the original Surface Pro, which was the same form factor as the RT, except it was like twice as thick. It is a chunky little uh, tablet. Uh, I've got one of those as well. They're fun. Um, back before, it's, back then, like we were trying to get Intel to do lower power tablet friendly uh, processors. Like I also have a Surface Pro 3 here. Um, mm. And like that also had more of a desktop type or something that required a lot more cooling than you can provide yes. in a typical tablet. Uh, and I remember like when I first got that, it would overheat until we released some uh, firmware updates that made it more aggressive with the throttling. Um, yeah. But I was doing uh, the initial setup of that right after I got it, it throttled uh, or it heated way up to the point where I kept getting during the installation, that little thermometer on the, the main screen. And this was day one, like of them mm. being available. Um, and then we, you know, like I said, we had to push out the firmware update to cut that out. So I was it's running nice it from Intel the other way. Yeah, Intel has come along. So it, Intel gets a lot of flack for not doing ARM type cooling on processors, but they've actually come quite a ways with um, lowering like their kind of wattage requirements and and making their um, making their processors more tablet and laptop friendly. They're still not you know uh 20 watts like uh like the the m1 is at, at kind of max or whatever but they're uh, they're quite a bit lower than they were like five you know seven actually 2012 was more than five years ago 10 years ago we'll say um that uh, uh then folks give them credit for i think mm. 
I mean, also, it's the sort Song. of thing that's, that's the opposite of, of what we're often looking for. We're actually looking for uh, processes that don't shut down, processes that stay at the same speed the entire time. Because if we're looking for stable audio playback, one of the things we look for is a constant process of speed as opposed to a power saving one. Right. So, you know, yeah. these sorts of things work against us. It's, you know, one of the questions I get with the, the Surface often is, is it a great machine for music? And it's really not because it's not designed for what we want it to do. What it is, is a great form factor that I found I find incredibly useful and creative to use. But it's no, it's not, it's not ideal for music at yeah. all. But, you know. Like I said earlier on the, the call, like most people who make music on a computer should probably be on a desktop. Like if you're not taking this, and it's not just the, Oh, well, I might want to take it someday, right? Because that's a solvable problem. It's the, you know, folks that leave it mostly plugged in in their studio and do most of the work, um, you know, connected to it, um, you know, with a large screen display and a bunch of other stuff uh, permanently it's uh, connected to it. They don't, they should use a desktop with proper cooling, with big fans that don't sound like jet engines, right? They, they really shouldn't be using a laptop, um, you know, build it yourself. It's actually not scary to build your own PC from mm. parts these days. It's quite easy to do and you are at least as likely to have good audio performance on that as with a random laptop that you buy any place right and Absolutely. at least you'll know what's in it so that you can talk to people about like what the best things are to put in it uh so let's see steve uh, mcdougall asks how is latency with the cme midi dongle uh, i haven't tested that yet um but that's uh, probably a good thing for me to do we have this thing where I can't publish benchmarks, right? That's, um, you know, working at Microsoft, we have this thing where I can't do a test of a partner hardware and publish a benchmark on it without right. involving the legal and PR departments, both of which are going to say, no, don't do that. Um, <laughs> that our PR it's anytime I've ever asked our PR department if I could say something about something, their default answer is like, no, I have to just go way out of my way to convince them to let me say something. Um, cause that's the easiest way to deal with public relations is not to say anything. Mm. Um, so I, I will test it, but I, chances are, I'm not going to be able to produce a number for that. Um, maybe I build an application that people can use themselves to test the performance of these things. Maybe that's the easiest way to go. Uh, to do Hatsune Miku. Nice. We have no, um, no virtual singers here. Uh, oh, we somebody... need an audio. Yeah, yeah. Somebody asked that earlier, didn't they? Is there a way of of having a, a button that you could press that just turns Windows into this into this other machine somehow? Right. We've we've been looking for that button for a long, long time. I think. Yeah, and, and Betty, I mentioned this earlier. Like, I started to do basically that um, some years ago, and it's just it's so different for every single PC, hardware, software external interface combination that other than just a couple things around power management and stuff, it just wasn't anything that I could produce out there that, uh, that would make sense and not fry one computer or make one computer worse mm -hmm. while it makes another one better. I mean, the other factor you have to think about is, is what the user uses. I mean, one of the things we did at Carillon, uh, towards, towards the end of its days was we built, um, a shell over windows that locked yeah. everybody out. So all you had was a, a row of buttons in the middle. Yeah, one ran Pro Tools, another one ran the audio interface software. And that was pretty much it. And it was brilliant because it, it, it removed the whole technical support area because you couldn't do anything on the computer other than run the music software. But customers hated it because they couldn't do anything. They wanted to fiddle. They wanted to install some crappy piece of software for some crappy place in order to find some crappy thing out, you know. And it was inevitable that users want to do more than just the pure process of, of running audio. They want to listen to, to Winamp. They want to listen to this and the other running at the same time. They want to go on the internet. They want to do these other things. And as soon as you start to shut Windows down into a into a single use scenario it's you know the customer base won't accept it they won't accept the program right like if you can't open up chrome or edge like those alone like people not being able to get into their browser or something on those mm -hmm. machines suddenly makes it useless for a whole lot of stuff you might want to look something up really quickly but um like it, 
people don't realize how big pro, uh, browser applications are, but they need a whole ton of other stuff in the system that has to be switched back on to make that function properly. Yeah. Uh, and then there's like, so you can put your PC into something called kiosk mode, which will kind of lock you to a single application on there. Don't do this, please, um, on your own <laughs> PC. But you know, if you need to go like, get out and use a, a, an editor, or you need to use something else that's not hosted inside the DAW, it just be, it becomes too restrictive. I mean, I like the idea of it. It just it it kind of breaks down very quickly. It's like Bring booting, back uh, booting into a Linux you know distribution just to run uh, Ardor or, or something of that was which something else which we've toyed with over the years, and again, it's a beautiful idea, but it's. I don't know it just be, if something yeah. becomes more too bothersome, too much trouble, it's just not going to stick. <laughs> Highway to Surfdom says, "What is Edge? Edge is our Chromium-based browser that uh, comes with Windows 10. Oh. So it's it used to not be Chromium-based, but now it is. So it's compatible with uh, everything Chrome is compatible with. And that's all I'll say because I don't want to sound like a marketing person for the Edge team. But it's a good <laughs> browser. Try. Yeah, it works all right these days." I even use it on my iPhone, would one believe? And Wagu says Internet Explorer rebranded. Now, there's actually zero code from Internet Explorer in there. So, Yeah, I still have some apps that run Internet Explorer by default that I can't make it not yeah. do it. There is, you can get a tab open in Internet Explorer mode, which actually loads up the old Internet Explorer in that tab. Normal people don't need this for the most part, except for like the one or two things you'd mentioned you come into, but... Um, organizations actually need it. Uh, what about Windows multi-audio? I'm guessing that's aggregation or something. I think there's a translation issue there, supported via USB. Um, if this is audio aggregation, yeah, we did talk about that earlier. When we're talking about ASIO drivers, they don't do aggregation by uh, default. And um, yeah, rewind back uh, and watch some of the earlier stream on this because we talked a little bit about why we didn't do that in Windows. Hmm. Uh, Tony um, asks about convincing friends that Windows is made for music. I don't think there's any need to. I mean, um, my, my what's become my stock answer to the Apple PC argument is simply that you know use use whatever you like. No one's no one's trying to twist your arm into Windows. Um, from my point of view, I find, well, certainly with Windows 10, I find it extremely easy and open. Everything that I have runs on it. I can build my own yep. computer and run it on it. And when it ultimately comes down to the door software, it makes no difference what platform you're on because the, the door runs the same. So I could be running Pro Tools on a Mac, most, on a Mac yes. or on a PC, so you know. There are so, some that run better one versus the other, um, mm. but it's, but ultimately it doesn't really matter uh you know the performance difference is not enough to get kind of um mm. in a twist about um, but it's the same thing i tell like neither windows nor mac os were made for audio like full stop N neither of those are designed for musicians um but we do our very best on both sides to make sure that musicians are one of the supported audiences that can have a good experience on either of the two platforms and it comes down to which one you're comfortable with I would obviously prefer that you use Windows, but if Mac OS is your thing, then you know use Mac OS. I'm, mm. uh, you know, I'm not gonna try to sell one or the other here, really. Yeah, and the other big factor to to throw into that is that often people's experience or bad experience of Windows and music making is because they're trying to run it on a couple of hundred quid yeah. computer. You know, they've bought right. uh, they've bought a crappy little computer from Tesco's, and they're going, oh, I can't seem to get my thousand pound audio interface to install. You know, whereas when right. you buy an Apple, you buy a really good computer every time because that's all they supply. So if you spend yeah. a little bit more, you know, time researching the computer or buying the bits or getting just a computer from a reputable firm, it's going to be yep. a much easier experience. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Because uh, I've seen a lot of threads on uh, gear slots and other things where people are like, "How come this laptop is not good for audio?" And how come it feels so cheap or whatever? And it's like, "Well, you spent three hundred dollars on a laptop at Walmart. Um, yeah, like you'll probably be able to get things to run. Uh, it's just not going to be a kind of a great experience. It's not a thousand mm. dollar or two thousand dollar experience." Uh, Windows Ten rescued Microsoft. Cool. Okay, thank you. Well, Apple keep pulling the rug from Creative Pro users every few years. I I don't know. Um, the folks that are using Mac OS seem to be doing okay. Um, 
they they end up with like random bugs just like we do. Um, it's just you know it's it's an operating system. So I also use Linux for other things, just not on the desktop too. They're just there are three operating systems, and each have their quirks and each have their kind of good uses. So um, I will say I use Linux on Windows a lot. Like folks who haven't used Windows 10 uh, lately, like we have. A version of Linux built into it that you can use if you need. If you have, uh, it's mostly for developers as opposed to end users, but there's quite a bit you can do with it. And we keep adding more and more to that. So I see Wagyu mentioned uh, what they use on here. What Intel chip would be better for Ableton Live on Windows, the latest i7 or i9? There's uh, on several of the different sites out there, there are whole DAW PC build threads. Um, it, it's there's much more to it than just which processor you pick. Like, for example, if you have a Thunderbolt or PCIe audio interface, then you need to make sure that you have sufficient PCIe lanes to properly properly service that plus whatever other uh, devices you might have in your PC, right? And the processor will control a, a kind of a good part of that. But then all the rest of it is down to other stuff with the... Um, with the PC, like there, there are so many other variables that you can have in there. I have a on this PC that I'm using right now an i9 9900K uh, that I use. Is it better than uh, like a, a 12 core i7 or I, f I forget what the max i7 is, but there's an i7 out there with quite a few cores and lower stuff. I don't know. I have not benchmarked between them. Um, I think your audio interface is going to be far more important than, uh, you know, sort of which processor you use here. Mm. People make music on their lives too, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I've built a, a range of computers over the years. And one of the ones that at one time I was doing a dual Xeon quite often, it ended up being like about an 8,000 pound system that we would sell. And we sold a, a handful of them, certainly. And they were often sold for um, orchestral work. Um, so it was massive virtual instrument machines. And it would, it would breeze. It would breeze through it. But then something like Ableton Live, it wouldn't really give you the sort of impact that you'd imagine it would, right. uh, because it, um, Ableton certainly at that time wasn't particularly friendly to multi-threaded stuff. But using something like the Vienna uh, Orchestra, was absolutely ate that sort of stuff up. And it's a fantastic yep. um, system for that. That I mean, there's a system that didn't feel fast, but it just had acres and acres and acres of processing space. You know, processing power behind itself that you could just keep piling on more and more of these CPU intensive um, software instruments. You know, so it, it also yeah. depends on what it is you're trying to do. If you're trying to record a band, you can do it on your phone. You know, you don't need a fast processor. Right, right. And yeah, uh, some people want to be able to, you know, arm, you know, X tens of numbers of tracks at the same time to record. And yeah, like your processor starts to become a factor there. Uh, I would encourage people, um, they, this, the site gets a bad rep for constant arguments. It's sort of the Facebook of music, uh, uh, music tech out there. But uh, there is a thread on Gearsluts called um, Today We Build Our DAW PC or Audio PC or something like that where it's just tons of people saying, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And there's some good information in there that you may not have considered. So take a look mm -hmm. at that um, and understand, or at least the last pages of it, because understand that this changes from year to year and from interface to interface. Uh, does WSL bypass Windows audio drivers? I, as far as I know, it doesn't have any real audio uh, or MIDI support right now. So it's you know it's not something you're going to run Ardour on, uh, on, um, uh, on WSL here. It's basically in a virtual machine, right? So, and I haven't tested any audio there. Uh, did you, any any pressing questions here that folks are super interested in figuring out? Chip changes. Do, do, do. I'm just scrolling back here through some of the yeah. questions to make sure it's anything important. Edge is a decent PDF viewer and printer, yes. Printing PDFs, that's very, like, I was talking with my wife about that earlier today. Like, <laughs> we somehow need to be past the whole process of printing out forms, having to fill them in and then scan them, but it's still the easiest way to mm. do some things, which drives me nuts. I hate printers. They are the bane of my life. Uh, even today, I had to reinstall the printer driver for no reason, uh, but that's yeah. what it took. 
And I, I have, in fact, I have video of me smashing a printer outside in my garden <laughs> because but, I was so pleased to get rid of that particular one. Oh, yeah, simple thing. Uh, Brian says Pi's get more mileage under Linux. Uh, yeah, they do. Honestly, like those two are are quite uh, tightly coupled uh, on there. Uh, I have a Raspberry Pi that runs Linux here that I use for Pi Hole, which is kind of a DNS black hole if you want to get rid of a lot of ads and stuff at, at the network level as opposed to at the individual computer level, uh, which I originally installed years ago because I had an old iPad Air and I would browse to places like Facebook on it and I just it was unusable because there was so much crap coming down on the page that the browser just couldn't handle it uh, on that older iPad. Uh, and then I installed the Pi Hole, and lo and behold, all those websites were usable again because the all the junk that was just churning in the background to to serve up all the ads and stuff was blocked. Uh, and then I've kept it since then. I've added some um, uh, I forget what we're calling it or what they're calling it now, but the, some exceptions to it to allow certain things through uh, for like Xbox achievements and things like that because they kind of block almost everything by default. Um, but it's it served us really well. Um, I actually like using it there, and it runs. It's like it's never more than like ten percent CPU usage. It's it's runs really well on this, and we have tons of devices in the house. Uh, and there's disco machines. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Robin. I say a uh, question from Justin June. This is something that we we're actually in the middle of talking about, funnily enough, offline which is, um, see, I've lost it now. He said, oh, yes, are we going to lose the ability to turn off Turbo Boost mode on future laptops? Now, this is something which I'm also in the middle of uh, because yeah. uh, through the last couple of Windows updates, Windows 10 updates, the May one in particular, it, it killed a particular function that we've been using for quite some time to, that allows us to take control of the performance of the CPU on laptop systems. If you're familiar with the power profiles within Windows, on a desktop, you get access to, to balance, to power user, or high performance, that's the one. And also through a little bit of jiggery pokery, you can get an ultimate power performance one as well. Uh, on laptops, a lot of that has been stripped out and we were able to re-enable it uh, using something called connected standby or disabling right. connected standby. It was always right, a bit of a right. hack, but it's kind of just what we, what we found. And it seemed to work, right. and it brought back these power features that enabled us to turn off, for instance, turn off turbo mode, because on certain laptops, it was that, it was the CPU going, yes, and then coming back down again that would cause glitches in your audio. And so right. you turn off turbo mode, and your processor would then sit at a nice stable level. And that's done us well. Ever since I had the Service Pro 3, that's from then onwards, I've used that sort of tweak in order to get it under control. It's now been removed. And um, uh, me and Pete have had conversations about this uh, previously, and I just haven't gotten around to doing it, to working it out until today, where I uh, <laughs> sat down with my Service Pro 7 and thought, right, I've got to sort this out. It had just gone through a load more updates and was now on... I don't know what the update is. It's 20H2 or something it's called. And yep. it had all gone, and I could not get it back. I couldn't find how to uh, how to, to re-enable those power settings so that I could get to it. And I also had no idea whether it was already looked after or had been sorted out in some other way. So at the moment, I'm, I'm stroking my chin about it, although yep. a couple of hours ago, I did find a solution that appears to have sorted my the one over there that I'm playing on. It might have sorted it out, but I haven't tested it yet. So, yeah. so what's the story then, Pete? What's going on? Hmm? Huh? Yeah. Hmm? I, <laughs> so, stories I don't know. Um, so, the, <laughs> the I know the teams do a bunch. So, what happens is the team does some stuff that's appropriate for the hardware that they're, um, you know, and their users that they they have the majority, and then it does something that hurts musicians. So, I have to then ping them and say, "Hey, this, by the way." is something that's not great for musicians and they're like oh that's not a scenario that we thought about and um here are the here are the reasons why we did it uh yeah. let me see if we can add something in a future update that will fix it or if they are um fully committed to not allowing something because they know it causes hardware to prematurely fail or something like that then they're like yeah sorry this this hurts folks um there's nothing we can do about it and that's kind of the full stop uh there uh, so on this, I'm going to check on it again now since it's removed again. Uh, a lot of times these things move to group policy just because that seems okay. to be the uh, second control panel, if you will, for a lot of this stuff. Um, and I, I, 
I hate to see everything move there, but I understand why it sort of keeps it out of the view of the typical user. And mm. you kind of only do go in there if you mean to. And then again, also only in pro, it's not available in home. Uh, so, um, uh, so I'll check on it. Like it, you would let me know about this uh, like an hour before the call. So yes. I'll look into it after this, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, it's. I mean, we kind of know why. I mean, it's. It's not. It's not that we're uh, because we're, we're essentially pushing something like the Surface. Uh, we're pushing it out of its normal profile, and right. Microsoft absolutely want it to stay working and have it not catch fire at any particular time. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas I want it to go to the edge of catching fire because I want it to to be very very stable, which is not where right. these sorts of um, low power laptops are. Low power in terms of battery, not right. low power in terms of performance. Yeah. And and so it's, what they uh, want, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, the heater, uh, the heater kicked in here, so it'll have a little bit of background noise. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. So what? Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Robin. So what the computer wants to do, the computer wants to use turbo mode to give you a bit of performance and then shut that down as quickly as humanly possible. And we're trying to prevent it from doing that. But the knock on effect is that that affects the, the heating profile, the cooling profile, the thermals, yep. uh, all those sorts of performance and battery life, which is very important. And so I completely understand why they don't want us to be messing around with those things. And again, in some ways, it comes back to that Windows performance button somewhere. You just want that little bit of access just so you can smooth out a couple of things while saying, I take full responsibility for what's going on and I promise not to break it. But that's that's a hard, that's a hard thing to yeah. ask of Microsoft. The funny thing about the I take full responsibility is most folks take full responsibility until it breaks mm -hmm. and then uh, then sort of conveniently forget that they did these tweaks or something and like... Yeah, I run into it a lot with other tweaks where they're like, oh, Windows doesn't work anymore and stuff like that. And like, I didn't do anything. And then when you really drill into it, they're like, oh, you disabled these things in the BIOS that, uh, you know, based yeah, on a yes. tweak list. So, and, you know, I, I understand why people do it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but it's like, mm -hmm. if we're going to take responsibility for things, we need to take responsibility for things and understand why we have settings out there that do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't. Know. Mm. <laughs> it's kind of a hard choice uh, on some of those. Uh, like I said, you you don't want it to catch fire, but you want it to get just about hot enough that maybe if you held some paper next to it, that paper might catch mm. on fire. I mean, but I'll look into it. After. Yeah, that, I mean, the that, turbo that'd be great. Yeah, you know. yeah, it'd be great. But one of the things you uh, you've said to me before, actually, which I think is is very very interesting, is about the sort of error reporting and statistical sendings within within Windows, because one of the tweaks that we would always do, we would be turning off uh, anything to do with reporting back to Microsoft on stuff going on. Right. Yeah, you know, all of that diagnostic stuff, all of that uh, send reports business, and all that background thing, because we would see it as the enemy, as being a background surface service that is stealing processor cycles. Um, hey, when and actually, you accept privacy concerns as well, right? So I yeah. get all that. Uh, when actually um, what, what you said to me was that um, the, one of the reasons why musicians are perhaps underserved by Microsoft to some degree is that we're not sending them any data. They get plenty of data from people playing games and doing other bits and pieces. They get no data from us because we've elected to turn it off. Yeah. And that blew and my mind. It, musicians are, are such a small, like it's a hugely influential audience, but it's also a really small audience compared to like gamers or something. Uh, and that's true on pretty much every operating system out there. So um, I I don't want to guilt people into, you know, a, a enabling telemetry on that, but just understand that, like, it, we, we use telemetry to figure out which APIs are used. And, like, in the past, we didn't have any data on certain APIs that were being used. And so they were deprecated, but it turns out they were actually being used, just folks had the, the telemetry turned off. Um, and then the same thing, like, when we get... Um, actual errors, like being able to log those in the feedback hub with a, a repro that contains a glitch trace for us, helps us out a ton. And if you have all that stuff turned off, then we can't diagnose it and it just goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all the pitch I'm going to make for that. I understand why people disable uh, these things and uh, I'm not going to argue one way or the other, but folks should know how it's used, you know? Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, there I think there was a question uh, Edna's Disco Machine asked, what are my favorite synths that I've got behind me? Um, I'm happy to do that one, but let's see if there are any other 
uh, important questions before that one. Uh, Songsmith Xbox edition. No, that's funny. Oh, there was a question. Folks- uh, actually, from somebody asked me back back a couple of years ago, back on uh, one of uh, the Surface presentations, there was a glimpse of a Microsoft door. It was there. It was something yeah. associated with Groove Music, I think, is, is yeah. what it was. And there was also, of course, the, the 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 keyboard that was replaced by some kind of you know musical yep. controller. You know, yes. whatever happened to and those I, guys? You have I one have of one of those. those box somewhere here um <laughs> this came out with the original surface rt and pro right uh and i know it turned out at the time there was not enough uh horsepower in the machine to do what we wanted but i don't understand why we didn't re-pick this up again later on but there was this whole idea of creating they were they were toying around with different names but one of the names was a blade creating custom blades for surface which was mm-hmm. that rectangular um, keyboard that uh, type thing that came out. And we had a, a 16 grid uh, pad controller on that, as well as I, if I remember right, some touch sensitive fader type things yeah. and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, I, I should have gotten it out before the call because they're so fun. And then we had a an application that was created by the team. Uh, it was actually created partially out of the Xbox team at the time, uh, which had um, music... Uh, I'm trying to think. We had stems from different tracks, and then we had logic inside the application that would rekey those based on like the key of the music that you were playing with. It was super fun. I have no idea why we would have dropped something like that because it was so much fun. Um, and I've I've question I've asked questions about it a few times, and it's just nobody has any stomach to resurrect it. Um, <laughs> by stomach, I mean money uh, because these songs aren't free. Uh, yeah, to resurrect yeah. them. just uh, oh, I don't know it seemed like such a fun thing I don't know why we we just didn't go any further with that um, I, there there are lots of things that happen that some of them never make the light of day uh, in companies like Microsoft where you're just like ah oh, I wish this would this would catch on because it's so much fun and so cool and that was definitely one of them um, yeah. yeah we even had an internal meeting uh, where what was it the one of the guys from Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Steve, Park. Yeah, that's right. Lincoln yeah. Park. What's the uh, What's the guy's Steve Aoki? Is that his last name? Something Could like be. that. Sorry, I'm. They'll know in the I'm chat. They always do. Messing up the name, um, but he did a small performance with that. Or I think it was an internal meeting or one of the events. He did a small performance with that, which was super fun. Um, and then we never published the um kind of the API for creating your own blades, which was unfortunate as well, because I was hoping it would be just like a standard protocol that people could create their own and, and have fun with that. But now oh well. I don't wanna I don't want to depress people. It was a super fun project. Was it musically <laughs> practical? For beginners, yes, but for most of the people that listen to your uh listen to your show and watch your show, Robin, it's probably a non player for them because it's it was very much a a fun mm. uh thing for people aren't musicians but i still think it was it was kind of cool uh to do all right so somebody asked what my favorite synth is behind me i have a bunch of stuff here um hmm there are a bunch of i I, so i've got them on the bottom i don't know oh you know what i'm not on that camera let me see if i can make everybody seasick uh oh my mess there we go so on this wall, so I've got a mini Moog, uh, mini Moog reissue at the top, but actually, what's below that? Um, I've got uh, uh, actually, there's a Chrome one RSS second. Super- look, look, look! I can put you full screen. Look, everyone can see it now. Oh, oh, I don't know gosh. if you look at me looking at you. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got a bunch of stuff here. It's hard to pick a favorite. You know, I'm not 12 anymore, so I don't have a favorite color or anything. But I have, uh, I have lots of synths that I like to use all the time. The, um, the the little Behringer modular stuff has turned out to be tons of fun. I've got uh, kind of a Moss Lab. Which way is it? This here. I've got a Moss Lab modular behind it that is uh, a lot of fun as well. Uh, sorry, you can see my mess. I've prioritized synthesizers over actually putting a floor and walls in this room. Um, uh, hard to say. The Chroma Polaris is a current favorite of mine. I, I really do like the way that sounds. Uh, and uh, the Monopoly below it is is kind of like an all-time favorite of mine as well. Nice. Yeah, that's it. 
And then I've got a bunch of stuff over here which uh, pops in and out. The, the Novation Peak I have is real, is uh, a ton of fun as well. If people haven't played with one of those for a poly, uh, it sounds fantastic. It's got like some really great sounds in that. I'd like, there are some new keyboards that I would like to try, but uh, I just don't have room for any more keyboards with a key bed anymore. You know? So what what are you interested in then? What's uh, what has piqued your interest? Uh, so the the Novation Summit is really nice, right? Uh, and then the the Udo uh, Super Six. Uh, which I yes. was looking at. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Mm. Uh, and I think that's kind of fun. And then there are, there are just hints of other things that are kind of coming out in the future that uh, um, it just sounds really promising. Like there's just a glut of of uh, hardware now that uh, you can just keep buying. Uh, I even have two things. So I just picked up a sub harmonicon uh, to go with uh, my Mother 32. Right, so. yeah. So I haven't had a chance to open it yet. It just arrived, uh, as well as well as a Behringer cat. Uh, so those two things uh, I'm interested in trying out to see how they work out. To me, nice. this is an expensive hub. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is. It That's is. Good. Yeah. Uh, it gives you. Uh, you know, it, it saves you having to buy rather than focusing on buying new graphics cards, or uh, you know, you get yourself in a in an i in right. an IT twirl of constantly upgrading your computer. It's really nice to spend it on different things, or you go down a plugin, uh, you know, rabbit hole where you're constantly upgrading plugins or buying more plugins or acquiring more right. software that you're not using. Uh, at least with hardware, I feel there will become a point where you can't physically fit any more in. So there is always going to be an end to it until you yeah. then have to move house or, or something or, or so like i said i've got the storage room on the other side here of synthesizers uh. that work done with them um and probably my favorite one in there is i have a roland sh7 uh in there oh yeah which the sound on that so that was my dream synth for quite a long time and i i spent quite a bit on that and of course it's had a problem since then that i need to deal with but um that one sounds amazing like i love the sound of that synthesizer and then i've got some other i've got a juno 106 over there to sort of bring me back to where i was in high school needs new voice chips of course um and there are some replacements for that that i can put in there um yeah it's just i have a bunch over there that i need to, it's some that i need to do some kiwi update i have a poly 6 that i need to do the kiwi update for uh which uh if Folks aren't familiar with it. The Kiwi Technic stuff takes the old synthesizers and gives them all new features for, um, you know, you spend a few hundred dollars on it and some soldering and uh, in some cases not even soldering. And it just, it adds so many new features to these. It's, they're just amazing. Interesting. Is it like an e-board on a DX7, that, that kind of thing? Is it adding? Yeah, they completely replace the processor and yeah. uh, uh, usually some other stuff. Because the, most of these synthesizers were limited only by the fact that the processors back in the early and mid eighties were terrible, right? They, mm. they were too slow. Like the, um, the matrix, uh, 1000 and, uh, um, you know, those, uh, the Oberheim ones and stuff, they had slow envelopes, but they had slow envelopes because the processors were terrible. Like once you get a new processor in there and you can have snappier envelopes, they become a completely new synthesizer. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting hearing Dave Smith talk about the Prophet 5 and how with the Prophet 10 originally, there was a Prophet 10 in the same shell as the Prophet 5, but it would overheat uh, because of the right. voice cards. And so they just couldn't make it work. So they had to, to do a double decker, and that was the only way they could do a 10 voice Prophet, uh, which, of course, they can do it better better now. Yeah, there's a lot they can do with those now. Uh, Dave Smith does some really great things. I don't have a ton of his stuff because... I'm not a big fan of that Curtis sound in a lot of his uh, synthesizers, but I do have a uh, what's it the Pro Two uh, that uh, I really like the sound of that that has uh, digital oscillators and a mm. kind of a nice 4 dB ladder filter in there. Um, but uh, some of the other ones I'm not too keen on the sounds of, but I do like the sound of his um, prof, uh, not the prof, the uh, Overheim one that he did. Yeah, uh, but I. But what I did instead is I have a Kickstarter. It's another thing that I need to do here is I pledged on the Kickstarter for the uh, the OB8 uh, rack mount clone uh, years ago for a kit for that, which should be coming out sometime, hopefully uh, in oh, the next yes. year. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And so that sounds 
really great. It doesn't add a ton of, of features to the OB, but it just it sounds fantastic. So I'm um, looking forward to getting that one in there instead of the kind of the, the modern uh, DSI stuff. I learned to code. Uh, so Citizen said, I learned to code on Z80 processors. Yeah, I learned on uh, 6502 on or 6510, excuse me, on the Commodore uh, 64. Uh, living in a shed, yeah. I need to knock down more walls and just make more room for synthesizers. My shed, so my shed has my other way too expensive hobby, which is uh, woodworking. So I have uh, all the stuff out there for that. And I should just uh, combine them all together and get dusty synths and stuff. Yeah, you need uh, to have more than one lifetime. That's that's the the key. Too many hobbies. Yeah, I, I I have more unfinished projects than finished. That's the uh, that's the problem. Uh, so highway to serfdom sub is great. Have you done uh, any MIDI two stuff? Um, and I, I talked a bit about MIDI two earlier. So um, you know I've uh, I'm the voting member for uh, uh, the MIDI org at Microsoft. So you know I voted to adopt all of that and I've been involved in that. Uh, and we have a new API coming that will support that, but it requires the um, except for MIDI CI, which doesn't require a new driver, the rest of it requires a new driver, which I talked about that a little bit earlier. Have you seen any uh, of it work? Have you seen uh, a, a MIDI yeah. 2.0 conversation? Yeah. Uh, frankly, Apple's further ahead uh, on us on that, as uh, so are like Roland and Yamaha and stuff. So I saw some really cool demos showing uh, some MIDI 2 stuff there. That like The, the big thing that um, it's really enabling, which goes beyond MPE, is... Uh, a lot of the dynamics for, um, you know, for performance, like being able to do a lot more with um, more than just the kind of the aftertouch that we're used to. And so some of those are really exciting. Like it really, mm. it, it, it makes it possible to be a lot more expressive at a higher fidelity than anything that we have today. So um, that's probably the, the biggest part. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, it, had, I did an interview with uh, Roger Lynn a couple of weeks ago at SoundMit. And uh, we talked, because it was involved in the original MIDI side of things, um, yep. talking about MIDI 2, he he was kind of nonplussed, to be honest. He sort of said, well, you know, my Lin instrument, my MPE instrument, it all works fine now. And he's not really, not that he's not convinced, it's just that, you know, it's not that important. He d he's not sure that people necessarily want what MIDI 2.0 is offering. I think we'll all be happy when it's here. I, I'm yeah. not sure who it is that's that's really driving it, if you know what I mean. It, it, so it's a bunch of different... So frankly, the two operating systems, the primary operating systems, need to have support for it mm -hmm. built in before it becomes a really big deal. Um, so Apple has been working on it. We're working on it. Uh, and until we have it such that uh, the DAWs can use it reasonably, um, it's not going to take off, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, they're, they're interested in it. And it doesn't... It provides more or higher fidelity versions of what we had before. So for folks who say that we don't need it, well, like think of all the, the, the issues we've had with, say, timing of MIDI messages in the past or uh, things that the DAWs tried to hide from us that were happening behind the scenes. Uh, mm -hmm. Things like speed, things like, um, you know, not getting responses back from devices. Like the, one of the things folks don't realize necessarily is that MIDI 2.0 is a bi-directional protocol. So there's communication between the device and the, the um, uh, in this case, let's say the PC, over USB, at least to start, uh, other, other transports in the future probably. So you can get a lot more information from the device back uh, in more of a conversational mode. So you can figure out like kind of what its current state is and uh, what it's doing at that point in time. And then you have really high fidelity controllers mm. where instead of you know being stuck with say uh seven bits or even 14 bit controllers like you have today you can have uh, essentially floating point uh variables like uh, floating point values uh, for different things like pitch bend and aftertouch and per note controllers and stuff and those they may not seem like a big deal to a lot of people but for people who are always looking for more uh, expression from their devices. I think this gives it uh, uh, in a better way than MPE does today. It doesn't hog up all your channels and uh, it doesn't uh, um, do any kind of like sort of kludgy stuff like that. Uh, it's kind of purposefully built to support um, these levels of expression as well as doing a lot 
or for the again like really big over in japan less so over here i think is uh being able to uh very easily map uh controllers to devices so if uh, the one that's always brought up is you say that this particular synthesizer actually, or this this keyboard has the draw uh, drawbar organ profile, and if you say like I support this profile, then the host application or DAW automatically knows what that means and sets up all the controllers for you, so mm -hmm. you don't have to match each one uh, one by one, right? Uh, and I think that makes a ton of sense. Being able to easily control uh, from one to one uh, on that, I think it solves a problem that many people don't realize that we have today mm. right but it's a problem then, of that course, will become it... more evident because we've gone external again because we have more midi devices yeah. to control another piece of hardware from a piece of hardware from a midi controller right. the is very laborious to map that in you know yeah because um, you're not going to be able to do it in software necessarily whereas if they just spoke to each other and told each other what they can do that would solve that entirely yeah, and that's especially useful for controller keyboards. Like, um, I used to have a bunch of uh, uh, Novation SL ones, and they had that weird utility application that would overlay the controls on your screen. Yeah, and auto map profile. was it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And it was super kludgy. Like, it was just always strange to use, but it did what it needed to do. Um, and there's no reason something like that should have to exist. So, mm. um, you know, these these new uh, capabilities deal with that. And then there's just un, uncapping performance. Um, you know, the we talk a lot about like MIDI latency and stuff, but like it takes, I think it was like a millisecond and a half or something like that to send a single note on message, if I remember correctly, um, across five pin DIN today, just based upon the speed of the protocol. So if you hit like a big chord, like there can be, you know, X number of milliseconds uh, from the first note to the last note. And a lot of software sort of hides this for you uh, today in one way or another, or we just don't hear it. But there's a perceptible lag, which maybe for a chord's not a huge deal, but on a drum machine, a lot of people really notice that. Like if you want to have uh, you know, multiple um, drum machines synchronized, you don't want to get like this weird kind of flange or you know, flam thing going on between them. Like, the performance is a big deal for that. Mm. I mean, as you mentioned... MIDI one, so yeah. you have to worry about. It. As you mentioned, uh, resolution as well, it, it being a factor. I mean, it's it's one of those weird things is is that you you don't really notice it until you notice it, and then you can't unnotice it. If that makes sense. I've been reviewing yeah. over here. I've got a, a modal um, Cobalt Eight. I've been reviewing that um, the last week, and because it's essentially, uh, I mean, it's not a, a VST instrument in a box, but that's the idea because it's virtual analog. But the control system appears to be MIDI. So when you're turning the nice big fat filter cut off, you can hear each of the 128 steps, you know, it, when you're going yeah. slow enough. In normal usage, if you put an LFO to it, it's not there. But moving right. of that knob, the resolution of the knob, because there's a MIDI layer in there somewhere, um, you can you can feel it, you know, and uh, it's difficult to unfeel, as I say, once you've uh, once you've come across it. And Dave Smith has said publicly, like, oh, that's a solvable problem in software where they use interpolation to do this. It's like, yeah, but why should you have to solve that with interpolating values, um, you know, if we could just have higher resolution controllers to begin with? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I was looking for any other last questions here. Perceptible lag is how... <laughs> Funny. Uh... <laughs> Oh, Robin said you're, yeah. What did I Robin say? Said my, uh, it said, Darren M says, Pete, Robin said you're Moog. Uh, Darren, I keep, I've been listening to Nick too much lately. Moog <laughs> sub kind of this week's prize for us punters. Uh, no, I just got it. It's a new toy I want to play with. Um, and folks making the argument that Ethernet is cheap and reliable. Yeah, there's, there's definite interest in doing MIDI 2.0 over Ethernet. Um, and right. I would like to see that happen because you, the distance is, um, really, really help. So again, my PC is on the other side of the wall. Um, and so I have, you know, USB three connections to kind of industrial hubs on different sizes, uh, sides here. It would be nicer to be able to just do that over ethernet in a reliable way, right out of the PC, as opposed to, um, having to do all this like weird stuff to work around the fact that 15 feet is too far to run a USB cable, you know, uh, <laughs> 
Will Windows get an alternate audio driver like Core Audio? I talked a little bit about that at the beginning. No plans right now. Uh, Osio is is where to go if you're making music on Windows, in my opinion. Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're good. I mean, we're hitting two hours now, which is which is quite a session uh, and yeah. uh, a nice round session. I think we've covered a lot of space, uh, a lot of time. Is there any anything that you feel we should have talked about, Pete, that we haven't spoken about? No, I, I think this is a fun chat. If other folks uh, um, have other questions that weren't addressed here, I'm happy to either pop on again someday uh, when there's interest or uh, tweet me at, uh, at Pete underscore Brown on Twitter, uh, where... I, I try to keep things moderately professional on my Twitter account, but, you know, besides the mm -hmm. odd uh, dad joke or something like that that mixed in with there, uh, I'm happy to answer questions there as well. I've put your Twitter uh, link in the description, I think, of this video is down there if you uh, oh, cool. yes. would Thank like you. to follow the man. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel here as well where I post a lot of random stuff, music, etc. Uh, and, uh, you know, happy to have people check that out as well. So shameless plug on that. Yeah, totally totally so cool. uh, all right then well what i'll i'll just remind you that tomorrow um i'm talking to uh, lee from personas we're going to talk about uh, doors studio one course obviously and also audio interfaces so the idea of tomorrow night is just to chat about uh, doors audio interfaces control surfaces how those sorts of things fit together and uh, what studio nice. one's all about this time uh, around version five recently uh, emerged so we're going to do that uh, that's tomorrow, Wednesday night. I'm going to try to get Bitwig to talk to my modular uh, live. So that'll be fun. Um, nice. Thursday afternoon, me and Myla Melodies are getting together, uh, having an afternoon sort of a, you know, an afternoon drink, I suppose. And we're going to, to, to do the great debate of software versus hardware. What's better? Is it software? Is it hardware? Is hardware better than software? software? Yeah, that kind of thing. We're, so we're going to... Uh, talk ourselves around in circles over that so that'll be thursday afternoon and then friday i've i've said i'm going to do live stream windows tweak session so i've got to fix my service by friday and then tell you how i did it so uh so that's the plan between here and then is try to work all that out and hopefully present uh the best tweaks and also to discuss the idea because there is i mean as as me and pete have said there's lots of tweaks out there which aren't necessarily helpful or useful or do much anymore uh, i mean one of the one of my classic throwbacks is to say that well yeah, okay you can do that tweak then tell me how many more plugins you can run uh, <laughs> is it is it measurable in in plugin counts or are we just talking kind of nonsense really but at the same yep. time we we get familiar with things and we we feel that if we don't do this this tweak then something's wrong and it's not going to work but uh i have to say that as as a ex builder of computers that windows 10 has solved a lot of problems it's made things a lot of things much better now not initially necessarily but uh i mean i've really enjoyed i really enjoyed windows 7 uh, very very much i then uh i i made myself enjoy windows 8 and i became a bit of a fanboy because i had a touchscreen and i i got into it and i could understand what was going on even amongst the craziness and uh, so I enjoy that. But I also, what I enjoyed in Windows 8, funnily enough, was the changes to the file explorer. Simple little things that just made that suddenly work much faster and much quicker than Windows 7. And going back to Windows 7 became laborious. It was really odd how that happened. And it's very difficult to get across to people when they were blinded by the, the swipe swipey thing, which was a bit weird. But... Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I've enjoyed all of those. And then, you know, Windows 9, obviously, you know, it was me that said, you know, just skip to 10, mate, is, I, is what I said to, uh, said to your man. And Fine. he said, yeah, all right then, all right then, let's just skip to 10. Let's not call it X, that would be a disaster. So we went to, totally. uh, we went to Windows 10 and that's been pretty, pretty good all the way along. No real complaints with that. Um, in fact, I've, I've got a, an, I think he's an old customer. I can't remember now, but he's, uh, he's been trying to build this Windows 7 machine and he's had all sorts of trouble because <laughs> he's using absolutely yeah. everything brand new except for Windows because uh, he's insisting that Windows 7 is the way to go. I'm not going off Windows 7 that works for everything and he's had no end of trouble trying to get things to work. <laughs> and I can't even remember how to make it happen because it's like, oh, did you really have to do that? You've got to reinstall all that stuff. Well, first of all, you've got to make a floppy disk and you've got to put the RAID drivers on there. <laughs> 
you know it's yeah, yeah. like oh good grief so it's it's come a long way but so this what am i saying this friday and um, we're going to sit down and go through uh, the best tweaks or the most useful tweaks on on windows 10 and i'll try to demonstrate how that affects the performance on something like the surface so that's uh cool. that's friday so uh, there we are no doubt i'll be talking to you pete between here and then just to make <laughs> sure i've got that worked out All right that would be great well, really, uh, Robin, thanks for having me on the show here. This was uh, this was a ton of fun, and um, yeah. I really enjoyed the questions from the folks in the audience. Really great audience. Thank you all. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure to have you here, and thanks so much for agreeing to do it. So we'll probably, what time is it? Yeah, let's see, that's two hours. We'll probably toddle off then, and we'll leave you, yeah. uh, leave any other questions to another time. By all means, stick them in the comments afterwards, and... Um, we can get to him at a later point, but uh, hopefully see many of you later in the week. And uh, in the meantime, Pete, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Go make some tunes. Yeah. I'll hit the button. I will. I'll hit the button and then we'll go. <laughs> and we're out.